Angela is applying to join the library. Listen to the conversation and complete the form below. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 5. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will never hear the recording a second time. Hello. How can I join the library? Well, you need to make an application. Would you like to do it now? Yes, if I can. One moment and I'll get the form. Now, I just need to ask you a few questions before you sign at the bottom. Okay. Your full name, please. Angela Mary Price. Price? Yes, that's right. Okay, and your address? Apartment 3, 86 Bridge Street, Pimlico. Bridge Street? That's just near here, isn't it? Yes, not very far. Good. So the postcode must be 2065, right? Yes, that's right. Now, your telephone number. I need both home and work if you have them. My home number is 8763-5142, and work is 8456-1307. Do you need anything else, like ID or something? Yes, your driver's license will do, if you have one. Right. It's easy to remember. I know it by heart. 4040AC. I'm afraid I'll also need to see it. Okay. Here it is. Thanks. And your date of birth, please? 24 March 1981. Okay. Thanks. That's the most important part completed. But if you don't mind, I'd also like to ask you a few questions for a survey we're conducting. Yes, that's okay. Now you have some time to read questions 6 to 10. As the conversation continues, answer questions 6 to 10. What kind of books do you like to read? Here's a list to look at. Oh, it varies from time to time, but I always like to relax and learn about other countries I might visit one day. I don't like anything too heavy or serious, unless it's about animals or the environment. I'm not really into sport very much. Anything else? Well, I do like entertaining at home. You know, dinner parties. So I suppose you'll have something for me in that line. The pictures in those books always make me hungry, although they never seem to turn out exactly as they look in the books. Fine. I think that's all I need now, except I need you to sign here on the application form. Oh, and I almost forgot. The membership fee is $20, which is refundable if you no longer stay a member. There you are. Do I sign at the bottom here? Yes, that's right. You can borrow books now if you wish, although your membership card won't be ready until next week. So if you want to borrow today, you can pick up your card when you return your first books. That's if you want to take some now. I think I will, but I'll have a look around first. Okay. Take your time. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. You'll hear someone talking to a group of university students. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 17.
Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 17. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Upton University. I hope you are settling in and beginning to find your way around. I know how confusing it can be when you start life at university, and that's why we have Freshers Week to help you find your feet. Before I go any further, I should perhaps introduce myself. My name is Sally Jackson, and I am the Secretary of the Students' Union, which has organized this week of events for you. You will usually find me in the office on the first floor of this building when I'm not attending lectures. Anyway, down to business. Of course, there are a few things that you are obliged to get done during your first week here, but once you've opened a bank account, if you haven't got one already, senior director of studies to discuss which courses you are going to take and signed up with a doctor, there will be plenty of time left to enjoy the events we have arranged for the week. And have we got a lot lined up for you. Throughout the week from Monday to Friday, every morning starting at 10 a.m., there will be orientation and welfare events. These will include tours of the campus, which, as you have probably noticed, is the size of a small town with 9,000 residential students, as well as sessions on developing study skills. We also have tours of Upton itself arranged for you, with a bus leaving from outside this building every afternoon at 5 o'clock. There are a number of interesting things to do and see in and around Upton, so you can expect visits to the castle and museum as well as the popular ghost walk. You'll need to sign up for this one, as numbers are limited. Just put your name on the list on the notice board in the entrance lobby. An important event is scheduled for Monday, that's the day after tomorrow, when we will be holding the academic fair. This is an opportunity for you to speak to students and academic staff about the courses that are on offer. The academic fair starts at 1 o'clock, by the way. There are a couple of other fairs that I think will interest you. First of all, we have the Society's Fair on Tuesday the 16th, which I think is an absolute must. You might not believe it, but the university has over 150 societies and sports clubs you can sign up for, so you are sure to find something of interest to you. That also starts at 1 o'clock, and it will be here in the Union Building. Also in this building is the Trade Fair on Wednesday from 2 until 5 in the afternoon. This one might sound a bit strange because you will find a load of banks and other businesses here trying to get your custom. You will find plenty of bargains and, best of all, a lot of the businesses give away stuff for free. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 18 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 18 to 20. We've also got a great entertainment program lined up for you, starting tonight with our welcoming party. We have a top band lined up for your entertainment, but I'm not allowed to say who they are. All I can say is that I am sure you will not be disappointed. So come along to Blackmore Hall at 9 o'clock this evening to get your university experience off to a flying start. Just one point. I'm afraid this event is limited to freshers only. Because of space restrictions, you can't bring a friend tonight. Sorry about that. There's more fun and games on Monday in the Cotswold Theater here on campus. We have booked two of the cleverest comedians in the country, Paul Frazier and Jenny Brown, for a three-hour show. 
Paul has assured us that he and Jenny have packed the show with new material, and as they always get rave reviews for their shows, I think we can look forward to an evening of great entertainment. That's in the Cotswold Theater on Monday evening at 7.30. Moving along a bit, on Thursday, there is an important date for your diaries. This is the official Freshers opening ceremony, when the Dean welcomes you to Upton University. So remember, Thursday the 18th from 2.30 to 3.30 in Blackmore Hall. You certainly should go to this one, and by the way, light refreshments will be available. At the end of the week, on Saturday, you have the chance to dress up in your smartest evening wear for the official Freshers Ball. Actually, although it's called a ball, it is quite a relaxed affair, so we are more than happy if you turn up wearing jeans and a t-shirt. The important thing is to relax and enjoy yourselves. Time and place are the same as for this evening's party. Blackmore Hall from 9 in the evening to 3 o'clock in the morning. Right. I think I've covered the most important and exciting events we have lined up for you, but there will be plenty of other things going on throughout the week, so remember to check the notice board in the entrance lobby regularly. Enjoy the rest of the day, and I look forward to meeting as many of you as possible this evening at the welcoming party. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You will hear an interview with Professor Green from a local university which enrolls a large number of overseas students in its courses. He is talking to Indra, a student representative about the importance of attending lectures. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 24. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 24. Good afternoon, Professor Green. Thank you for your time today. I wonder if you could explain why you think it is important for us to attend lectures in a course that we're studying. Well, despite the increasing dependence on online communication these days, I do think it is important. Apart from delivering the content of the lecture itself, I believe that there are some general communication benefits from having large groups of students together in one place. For lecturers, it is an opportunity for us to address many students together at one time. For students, it helps you to feel part of the wider learning community who are following the course. You can interact with each other both before and after the lecture to discuss the ideas and content networking with each other and comparing your notes. But isn't most of this achieved, as you said, these days through online communication? Well, lecturers do communicate with students online, of course, but we usually only give a summary or notes of the lecture, so there are significant differences. When you go to lectures, you get more of an insight into what the lecturer considers important. We give additional commentary and anecdotes, and by voice emphasis, we can alert you to the key concepts, theories and issues of the subject. By not attending lectures, you might miss crucial information about what we are expecting in an assignment. You know, these extra things can make a difference. 
OK, but there are tutorials. There is a lot of interaction between students and lecturers in tutorials. Can't all this be done in tutorial discussion groups instead of having lectures? Yes, to some extent. But during lectures, the lecturers can sensitise you to the debates and the controversies that are dealt with in the literature. This can help you think more critically about the subject. So then, when you come to the tutorial, you'll be able to come with some questions and ideas for discussion. The result of this is that the tutorial class will be more beneficial for everyone who attends. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 25 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 25 to 30. I see your point. However, surely this also depends on whether students are able to understand and follow the lecture well. What strategies do you recommend to help students get the most out of lectures? I would say that first of all it is important to do some pre-reading. By doing this you get an orientation to the topic. You'll become familiar with the key terms and you'll be able to follow the lecture points more easily. I also think it is good to arrive early to collect handouts and to find a seat where it is easy to see and hear what is going on. Then, importantly, during the lecture itself, you need to be attentive. I know from experience that it is often difficult to be attentive. What can students do to improve their attentiveness during the lecture? I think that there are two keys to following a lecture successfully, using the visual cues and using active listening techniques. By maintaining eye contact with the lecturer and following how the lecturer makes use of the slides, whiteboard and so on, you are using the lecturer's visual cues which help make the structure of the information clear and give you a sense of what's important. Then, using active listing techniques will also help you to process the information. What do you mean by active listening techniques? Well, you need to pay attention to the methods the lecturer uses to highlight important information. As I said before, in the spoken language of a lecture we get the benefit of things such as stress and intonation, use of examples and anecdotes, as well as the language signals used to show relationships between ideas. Yes, I see what you mean. These things will be missing in written summaries. And what about taking notes? Does that help? Taking notes helps you to concentrate, so I would certainly advise you to do that. It's difficult to listen and write good notes at the same time, so it does take some training. Yes, taking notes needs a lot of practice, I've found. Do you have any other advice? Well, I can't finish without stressing the importance of formulating questions while you are listening. During the lecture, you should ask yourself questions about the content of the lecture and the points you are following. Ask questions like, what are the benefits or problems? What other examples are there? How does it work? Why does this happen? This will keep you focused and actively engaged in the content of the lecture. Professor Green, thank you very much for your valuable tips and your time today. You are very welcome. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. 
Part 4 You are going to hear a talk given by Jim Allen. He is going to share some of his findings of his research. Now you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Good morning. Today we'll be hailing from Jim Allen, who will be sharing some of the findings of his research project from last term. Jim. Thanks. Well, to start with, a little bit of background about the project. As you can see, our title is something that is relevant to everybody in this part of the world. Water safety. These days, there's a lot more to water safety because of the increasing number and range of boats and other things people use on public waterways. I'd become interested, through reports on radio, about the number of incidents involving small power boats and individual watercraft, such as jet skis. It seemed to me that because these craft were essentially recreational and didn't require licenses to use, there was very little opportunity to influence the users towards being safety conscious. So, I decided to make this the focus of the project. For the research, we mainly relied upon talking to people, asking them questions in preference to using a written questionnaire. We interviewed a wide range of people at a number of popular swimming locations over two consecutive weekends and asked them what they'd observed or experienced themselves. The respondents were both male and female, but the men were just slightly in the majority. We were pleased with their willingness to talk about the subject and, all told, interviewed 145 people over the two weekends. So, what were the findings? As you can see, 86% of people reported having had some type of problem. A surprisingly large percentage, 27%, commented that they had found it necessary to shout at an offending powerboat. But the main type of problem was the deafening sound that some of the boats made. On occasions, this led to swimmers deciding to move to another location. So what strategies did people adopt to ensure their own comfort and safety? Let's have a look at the figures. First, it was noticeable that there were often distinctly different answers between men and women. It was mainly the women, for example, who said they should try to choose places where boats couldn't go, whereas it was usually the men who said, you shouldn't have to move if you were there first, so you should shout at them if necessary. Both men and, oh, sorry, no, it was women, who said, you should call the authorities if the situation gets too dangerous or the powerboat drivers are acting irresponsibly. Then, I had thought it would be mainly women, but both sexes made the point that above all, it's important to get children away from any possible danger. Men were very aware that jet skis could be unpredictable in inexperienced hands. They also made the point that it's much safer to have your car nearby and clearly visible to any watercraft if you're swimming in a relatively remote spot. Finally, wearing visible clothing, men didn't think it was quite as important as women, but both gave it a high safety rating. When we asked them what they thought the government should do to help solve the problem, That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.